Okay, we welcome you here to the sixth Sunday of Pentecost readings. Uh, one of the reasons we do this is to help you in your worship on Sunday, you know, Saturday or Sunday or whenever you go through the worship during the week. A lot of times those readings are a little challenging and I think a little background can be uh, quite helpful to you. Um, these readings today, I think, are pretty self-explanatory. The Old Testament reading, which is our Isaiah reading, and our Gospel reading uh, speak about the power of the Word. And when we speak about the Word, we're really talking about Christ, who is the Word, but also the things that He says. So you have the Word Himself and the things that He speaks of. I want to thank Aaron Beckman, who is our seminarian here, a wonderful uh, man that's uh, preparing for the ministry. We did the Bible study last week, and I was very pleased and impressed with the, the amount of effort and time he put into that uh, study from last week. Okay, so a little bit of background to Isaiah 55. This is one that uh, is one of my favorites. In fact, I have preached on this probably four or five times. I'm not going to do it this week uh, because the theme is just uh, fabulous in terms of of the innate power of God's Word. So the background is Isaiah 55 at the beginning says, Come to me, all, everyone who is thirsty, come for those who have no money, come and eat. So there's this invitation, this grace-filled invitation. Goes on in chapter 55 to speak about an everlasting covenant he has for his people. And then... There's this phrase that occurs prior to today's reading. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. It's a fairly often quoted passage. And usually it's in the context of, you know, God does things we wouldn't have expected or been surprised at. And maybe some big event in this world or look back on our lives and so forth. And that's true. He, 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 he works in that way. But the surprise here, the reason why his thoughts are not our thoughts or his ways are not our ways, is particularly tied to the gospel. The good news that we're going to hear next concerning the power of the word. The power of the word and the transformation, transformative power of that word. So let's go ahead and get into our reading for today, Isaiah 55, 10 through 13. Let's start out with verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and shall succeed, a purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Not propose, purpose. Okay, so uh, purpose, very simple here. Water and snow are purposely sent by God to create. His word does something. It, it, it's powerful. Like, like, like the uh, snow and the rain, uh, it is keeping nature going. So you see God's creative work not only in creating creation, but he's continually providing for creation. And we're going to see how he provides also for us. He parallels that. So my word that goes out from my mouth. So even greater than the rain and the snow that provide for the vegetation of the earth is the word that come directly from him from his mouth. It shall not return empty. It won't be vain. It's not worthless. Think about this. Reading scripture. Hearing scripture. The sacraments, they are always effective. I, I'm always intrigued when people will say or think, uh, and maybe they don't say this directly to me, but they'll, they'll say, I didn't get anything out of the service. And I grant you that. Sometimes um, pastors are not always on the top of their game in terms of sermons and the hymns can be a little challenging and other things going on in your life. But what you have at every service are the words of God, are the words of God, and they do something. It's what God is at work with those words. That's what it says here. It shall accomplish, the word here for accomplish is a prosper, bring success, 
uh, not in the worldly sense, but as God wants it, but it's a good thing, brings power, for which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So it's the, um, we sometimes call this the performative nature of God's word. It actually does something. It has kind of an innate power within itself to, to do something. Um, verse 12, verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Before I get to that verse, I wanted to quote another passage from Hebrews 4.13, which also expresses this power of the word. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, dividing the soul, joint and marrow, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Okay, so it, it, it does something there. Great verse. For you shall go out in joy. Now the word for joy here is the absence of fear. We live our lives in fear. All kinds of things. Um, things that can go bump in the night. Things that we don't need to be afraid of, but are afraid of, and so forth. But you shall go out and joy. This change is going to take place. And be led forth in peace. Um, and that is that uh, the enemies are no longer going to uh, face us. And we all have enemies. So, in fact, we know from the scriptures, the devil, the world, and our sinful nature are very real enemies in this world. Now, as, as we go into this sort of transformation that takes place, we might say, well, when is this? Is this talking about heaven? Is it talking about when Christ uh, uh, died and rose again and the transformation that takes place? Is it talking about our, our baptism and coming to faith? You probably can guess what my answer is. The answer is yes. And each one is a progression, especially heaven and the coming. This is, this is a... Uh, transformative, but this is the kind of change that takes place in an individual lives. It, it switches around creation. And quite literally, at the second coming of Christ, uh, it, creation itself is no longer in bondage, but the world itself and everything in it will be transformed, okay? Uh, and it changes, uh, you know, mountains and hills shall break forth into singing, trees shall clap their hands. This is a reversal of the fall of sin at the Garden of Eden. So you have, remember that? You had thistles and leaves and the, the creation being in bondage. This now creation is free to, to rejoice. Instead of the thorns shall come up the cypress. So the cypress here is a, a, a tree that doesn't lose its leaves, kind of like an evergreen tree, so it's going to continue the opposite of a thorn. Many things can be thorns, plants that are thorns. Um, instead of a briar shall come a myrtle. The myrtle is a flowery type of tree, beautiful tree, a bush kind of thing that has flowers with it. Um, so again, these are opposite type of plants uh, that will, will take place. And it shall make a name of the Lord an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And that word, it shall make a name of the Lord, is a little odd phrase in English, but it's simply talking about that the reputation of God, uh, the name of the Lord is uh, shall be lifted up. Uh, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Sign here, we see often in John where Jesus will talk about his miracles as signs. The covenants, the promises of God are signs. And, uh, um, and he talks about a sign for you. So this word, which remember is the words of Jesus and Jesus himself, death, resurrected, ascended Lord, promises to come again, it's going to change everything, uh, including all of creation. And although we know that this is figuratively in terms of mountains clapping their hands, there is a, a literalness to uh, the creation itself being transformed. Everything is changed by it. Sounds pretty good. All right, let's move on to Romans 8, 12 to 17. All right. So prior to this section here in Romans, we're living by the Spirit, not by the flesh. All right, so when you're changed, 
come to faith, it changes your actions, um, changes everything about you, okay? Here's how he says, So then, brothers, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. When you're in debt to a bank or something, you are obligated. They, in a sense, are your master. They rule over you in terms of they have control, right? What he's saying is prior to conversion, we had no option but to live according to the flesh. That even if one did good things prior to conversion to faith in Jesus, um, we certainly didn't do good things in terms of the first three commandments. Fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, God, his name, and his word were not part of our lives, right? So um, you were obligated to the flesh. We shouldn't be surprised when the world does things that are according to the flesh. That just is the what happens. That's kind of the result. He says, but you're not debtors to that anymore, to live according to the flesh. He knows that from the perspective of the future, you look back on that and you said, those that live according to the flesh die. The wages of sin is death. And death is not just the absence of breath. It's the absence of a relationship with God. And outside of God, we can't sustain anything. We are judged. But if by the Spirit, remember what the Spirit does, the Spirit brings us Christ, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Again, this is that death-life language. We have this great privilege of getting to die to sin, to put to death. This is a very baptismal type language, Romans chapter 6. And this is the way sin is dealt with. You cannot change sin by reforming it, by covering it over. The only way to deal with it is if it dies. And it, it dies in Christ. I want to read to you a quote that I, I've used in the past. This, there's a little variation to this quote. And I don't know, even know who the original source was. So, uh, but I'm going to read it. It's not from me. If God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If he had perceived our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent an entertainer. If God had perceived our greatest need was political, he'd send a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent a medical doctor. But he's perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and so he sent a savior, okay? So again, you've got um, this is the implications of what, what he has done. Okay, so uh, for if you are led by the, the Spirit of God, you are sons of God, all right? Uh, again, um, led by the Spirit of God means, means by the grace of God trusting in Christ. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, during this time, it's difficult for us to speak of and use the language in our particular culture of slavery, um, ownership, things like that. that. That is the context, though, of Romans. And you do find that one-third of the Roman world at the time was in some form of, of service, subservience, various forms of, of slavery that took place. It just was the reality of that particular place. And so people knew the language of that. And it means you're bound. You're not bound to fear. You're not bound to sin. Sin no longer has the final say over you. It's not who you are. You're somebody else. You receive the spirit of adoption. You're grafted in is another way to put it. And, and I've said this before, but I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a great picture. Sometimes people who are adopted, you know, are, is that my real, you know, who's my real parent or vice versa? And those who have adopted say, you know, that, that is my child. And we don't think in that fashion. But I think in terms of the book of Romans, adoption is actually better than natural birth. Because God 
totally separate from us. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. He brought us. He adopted us. He brought us in by his choice, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, this was interesting to me. I had not heard this before. But that for Jewish people at the time, they thought this term uh, Abba, or Abba, Father, which was the cry of a child to its parent, was a little bit too chummy with God. And so they would always use the term Father, not as Father of Heaven, or they would put a, a, a parameter that gave it a little more dignity here. Notice that Jesus does not hesitate even in his, to talk about Father and just leaving it at that. There is this sort of relationship, child to parent uh, image that he's not concerned about, that, that, that represents uh, what's, what's taking place here. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And I struggle with this verse a little bit in terms of what does it mean, our spirit combining with the Spirit. And I think it just means that um, the Spirit comes to us, connects with us, with our souls, and so forth, that we are children of God. Um, the Spirit is the guarantee of our faith. Uh, it'll speak in that language. And what greater title, as you think about who you are, than being a child of God, a child of the King? Um, not no greater title. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now, here's the key thing about being heirs of God and of Christ versus being an heir here on earth is this privilege of being an heir, receiving all the benefits of our maker, doesn't have an end point to it. It, it goes on forever. He has an eternal characteristic. We also get his benefits, uh, inheritance of his blessings unto eternity. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This reads a little bit oddly, I, I, I guess. You know, what is this suffering he's talking about here? Um, it, it does kind of jump in here kind of differently, but I think it's a reminder for us and for the people of God that this side of heaven, of our eternal home, there is suffering. Paul, when he was converted, was told this by God, by Jesus. I must show him how much he must suffer for my name. Um, and, and just one of many places, uh, Jesus to his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. So, so all of these great benefits and blessings that we receive, the status we have as children of God, you can have all of this and still suffer for the name that you're under this side of heaven. Continually remind us of that. And, and some refer to this in a fancy way as a theology of the cross rather than a theology of glory. Theology means a study of God. God works in the midst of suffering. He is still at work uh, through Jesus. Uh, versus uh, somehow the, the more you reach um, spiritual maturity or over time, you know, somehow you're going to suffer less or have less bouts of depression or health risk and so forth. And that, that just simply is not the biblical message here. Moving on to Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. And Jesus here does a wonderful thing because he, he explains his parable. He explains what each of these parts means. I'm uh, preaching on this on Sunday, so I've been contemplating this quite a bit. Um, what's noteworthy here is that Jesus was doing a lot of kingdom things, great things, prior to these verses. Healing, the blind were receiving their sight, kingdom of God is at hand. And yet the response at some places, not all, but some, was very minimal. In fact, there was a lack of repentance, uh, a lack of faith. Um, and, and so how do you deal with that? Well, this great Jesus doing great words, and yet it just seems to fall on deaf ears. And so Jesus explains 
sort of the nature of the word and the response to that word that, that is going to take place and has been taking place. So let me read through this whole section of, through verse 9. This is just the description, and then the, he'll explain things afterwards. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. So just a little note here. Uh, notice what Jesus is doing. He is, there's such great crowds, he's got only room in the, on the, in the boat. So he's sitting on the, on the boat, on the beach, in the boat, and the people are standing. It's kind of the opposite of what we do today in teaching, right? The, the teacher stands and everybody else sits. Well, he's doing the opposite. So he's, he's sitting and they're standing. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some feeds, seed, some, feeds, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. And I, I would just simply stop here and just say that this, the image of the farmer sowing gives us an image of the farmer as a, as a blessed thing, as, a, as a, a farmer who gives, and there's growth where this farmer gives. And of course, that's God, and, and God in Christ is, is a giving God. And that's one thing to recognize in all of this. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured them. I, I think of um, birds that would come after we were seeding on uh, farming, and we called them seagulls. Middle of North Dakota, we called them seagulls, and they would come and they would take the seeds <laughs> after we had uh, had the drill go by and drop the seed into the ground. Uh, they would come and partake of that up. This comes to my mind. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, and since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. The word for scorched here is they were, it was kind of a violent thing that they just couldn't survive. So it's like a plant was living in the morning, in the afternoon, dried up. And since they had no roots, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some of a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, ears, let him hear. I've always said that the, the most important thing in faith, the, the most important of our senses, is not our eyes and not our taste, our smell. Uh, it's our ears. It's hearing. Uh, it's receiving um, that message. So he who has ears... Let him hear. Uh, you also find out that the, the soil itself produced grain, um, or the God produced grain itself. The, 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 uh, anyway, we'll, we'll go into that more here. Here then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. So here's shorthand for uh, receiving it. The kingdom, you can't have a kingdom without a king, so this is Jesus and his words. Doesn't understand it means doesn't buy it, doesn't believe it. Uh, it sort of bounce off, it sort of pings off, all right? The evil one comes and snatches, that's another violent act. He just comes and takes it away. What has been sowed in the heart, that is what was sown along the path. I didn't write down this quote from Luther, but there is this sense of the Spirit putting his reign of grace in the message of the kingdom for a time, and then he'll move it someplace else for a time. And you can kind of see that over time within the Christian church in the world, that places that were a one-time Christian, i.e. Turkey, where most of the New Testament letters are written now is... Um, predominantly Muslim area, okay? So there's no guarantee that any one country or place will continue to have the gospel. I think in our land where Christianity is getting smaller and smaller, uh, you can go to Africa where it's just kind of exploding or to China and so forth. So um, going off on a little bit of a tangent there. All right, so sometimes hardened heart hearts are simply just hard. It just bounces off. Uh, and, um, okay, there's, there's just not a need. There's, the, 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 they don't, there's not a belief in sin, that, that we're the ones that need this. And so there's, the gospel message just, just isn't going to penetrate. There's just there's nothing there. As for what was so on a rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. 
Uh, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution rises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. I think of the, the parable of the man who built his house on a rock and one built it on sand. You know, same kind of principle here. The difference here is it talks about that, that indeed there was some growth here at the start. Um, this is often seen, at least in our context here in America, as sort of the emotional kind of religion. And, and I think we can maybe relate to this a bit. Uh, I, I can remember going to various camps and concerts and being emotionally um, moved by the message that was taking place. And, th and that's natural. That's a good thing. Uh, the thing about our emotional or experiential modes is they're not very good at uh, maintaining us. That, that we need not only that, but... I don't know if we need that, but that we, we have roots that, are, that go down deep uh, over time, uh, that we, we learn the catechism, we learn the scriptures, we learn our teachings, so that when tribulations, COVID virus comes along, things like that, we're not just floundering in the wind. And the, the thing is, this is what this is where we are in America. I mean, you got you got whatever you want out there in terms of philosophies and religion and so forth. So having a, a good foundation, roots that dig deep into the, the teachings of Christ, the time it takes for Sunday school and Bible class and Bible study and the week after week nature of it, that's all putting roots in us. Um, and the Christian being, being, being with other believers, I think, is also something. One of the sad things about the Christian church today is it tends to be separate from other believers. And not, not always, but in terms of just the sense of growing in our faith. And, and we need each other, and that can help establish roots within ourselves. As for what's sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So he gets two things here that are thorns, the cares, worries, uh, things that keep us up at night. Uh, I read one um, commentary or one sermon actually was talking about what are, the, what are the cares, what are the things that keep us from and kind of uh, snuff out, uh, overgrow the, 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 the faith, the word of God in our lives and think about anything that takes us from wanting or receiving his word, his Lord's Supper, his message, his forgiveness of sins. Those things, even good blessings, can sort of come in and just kind of snuff out what God is bringing to us here. So very, very real stuff here. Uh, deceitfulness of riches, we don't even recognize in our in our society that we, we base everything kind of on the economics and these are gifts of God certainly uh, but uh, one can get very consumed I, I really do think that as one progresses in life this is the temptation to kind of put your weight on these sort of things uh, when you're younger there are other sort of temptations of the flesh but this is one that happens as one gets older the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful now but as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, believes it, and understands it. Now, I read this, and I'm going to kind of use this in the sermon this week, that what, what has to happen to the soil is it needs to be broken up. And then when it's broken up, the seed kind of can sprout and do something. Uh, so what God wants is uh, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sin so there is this sense of unworthiness before God and it being honest about that recognizing the need by the grace of God uh, and what happens God can really work with that kind of soil he can really do some great things uh, he indeed bears fruit 160 30 fold I read someplace that typically was 20 fold I don't know how true that is but that's what I read so you're, you're just seeing the, the ramifications of the gospel of the kingdom going way beyond whatever else we experience, be they negative things, um, uh, death, uh, compared to our death, heaven's like this, right? So there's no comparison. Uh, our sin, forgiveness is like this. Um, our fears, uh, peace is like this. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the kind of nature of, 
of the gospel. There's this more than aspect to it. Alrighty, so I hope this was helpful to you. God's richest blessings to each of you on your week and on your worship.